Don't. First of all, I must crave the indulgence of all the ladies present for two reasons. Firstly, I'm male. Um, I hope you'll make all due allowances and understand that this deplorable condition is not entirely my fault. Secondly, before we tackle the juicy stuff about goddesses, women's mystery cults and cross-dressing priests, we must first take a look at some gods. Male gods. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. Just take a deep breath, hold your nose and hang on. Um, but first, we're going to look at Krishna. And uh, if I can get this computer to work. Um, it would seem that in different parts of India, different gods were assigned to the same psychedelic um, fungus. Psilocybe cubensis was um, uh, called Shiva in some places and Krishna in others. If you want to know all about Shiva, you can read my book. It's called Secret Drugs of Buddhism and is available through Amazon. Uh, or Robert Dickens, if he's around. Um, so, this, however, is about Krishna. And I will just... Uh, just um, go into the um, the reasons why he is uh, the apotheosis of the mushroom. Um, he's a cow herd, and uh, those who know Psilocybe cubensis knows that it grows on cow dung. Most mostly on it does grow on some other things, but mostly on cow dung. And his skin is dark blue. It's dark blue because that's the color of psilocin oxide. Uh, when you pick the uh, the mushroom, it generally turns dark blue, like Krishna. The in the tenth chapter of the Bhagavad Purana, uh, it has a compilation of legends about Krishna, and it's the locus classicus of all Krishna myths. Um, and when you read it, especially if you read it in Sanskrit, you see there are a lot of double meanings present. And they speak of him as if he is a mushroom. For instance, when he was a baby, his mother placed him underneath a cart. And he kicked up his feet and cried. The cart was struck by the tender shoot-like feet and overturned. Well, this is the, 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 the same cliché about mushrooms that we hear when they grow, they lift up paving stones and the rest of it. Um... But he, um, he also, when when born, the dairy maids waved a cow's tail over him, bathed the child in cow's urine, and coated him in powdered cow dung. They then wrote protective names on twelve parts of his body with liquid cow dung. Um, this is, this doesn't make sense unless you think of him as something which grows from cow dung. Um, so. A little later in the legend, we find another tale, which first, I thought this, this was just an adventitious addition to the Krishna myth, which was purely sexual and had nothing to do with mushrooms. Um, but when, when Krishna was apparently walking along the river Jamna one day, he came across uh, a group of dairy maids, unmarried dairy maids, who were bathing in the river naked. Indian, Indians don't bathe naked. They wear their under undergarments when they bathe. And, and so he stole their clothes and hid up a tree. The tree is a kadamba tree, which um, all parts of the kadamba tree are in fact psychoactive. It's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, but I don't know if that's relevant to the story even. <laughs> they, this, um, this image shows the... Uh, the event with a very phallic tree and rather older women than the um, the commentaries on the on on this say that these unmarried girls were between 10 and 14 years old he, before returning their clothes he made each of them worship varuna by um, uh, making namaskar to the heavens and uh, I thought this was just a, you know a dirty joke that they, he got to see them naked all individually and and they are they were bathing naked because they were practicing a secret rite of Durga the, um, the the goddess whose name means ineffable or unapproachable 
who I have separately and also in my book, if you want to buy it, it's, uh, it uh, uh, associates Dudgar with a specific mushroom which grows on buffalo dung called Paneolus cambogeniensis, and she is also known as, uh, known as um, Mahishasura Mardini, which means the crusher of the buffalo demon, and the uh, word Mardini is the same word which is used in the Rig Veda for crushing Soma. Um, uh, I, as I say, I didn't think much of this as um, a drug story I, I, until I was following up the buffalo deity thing and found that in Bihar state there's a tribe called the Ahirs who, uh, who also uh, have a Krishna-like god who is even said to be a cousin of Krishna called Birkua and um, he was also wandering through the jungle when he found a group of naked witches practicing their witch rites by dancing naked. He steals their clothes and hides in a pine tree. They discover him and this is when it, it turns out differently to the Krishna story. Instead of going to him and praising him and worshipping him and so on, they decide that Birkuar has to be killed. Otherwise, he will betray the women's secrets. And the group of witches, who, by the way, the word for witch in, uh, in the Ahira language is Dain, which I believe is a corruption of the word Dakini. Um, which has multiple meanings it, as it could be an enlightened female um, as well as a witch and the the Dians say to their leader this man must die the the leader of the so-called witches is in fact Birkuwa's sister <coughs> and he, this this fact he had not known until he discovered them uh, practicing their secret rite, and so she um, she sends a uh, a snake to kill him, but it gets trampled to death, and so she herself then reluctantly turns into a tiger and tears him apart. His ghost becomes a protector of tigers for the Ahirs, but that's a different story. Um, I, this sounded kind of familiar to me. I will uh, just show you a couple more of these. Uh, here's another depiction of Krishna in the tree. This is Krishna being a mushroom, by the way. There's a whole story of how he fought Indra. And um, he became a chatra for the people of Vrindavan so that they could shelter from the storm that Indra threw at them. Chatra is an interesting word because it means literally umbrella, but it's the only word that you could use in Sanskrit to say mushroom. There is no word for mushroom in Sanskrit unless you say umbrella, parasol, like chatra, atapatra, or you can say sprouting wormy thing, uchilindra, uh, which is what you find in poetry. And um, anyway, he, he becomes a chatra. So he's blue <laughs> holding up this golden mountain. Is he? Th they are telling him he becomes a mushroom. Um, anyway, uh, oh yes, the um, the peacock feather also explained in my book. It's a symbol of uh, philosophy cubensis, for the and it's a pun. There is a word for peacock nila canta, which um, means blue throat, but it's a pun on nila canta, which means blue stem, and philosophy mushrooms are often blue stemmed. So, um, here is Krishna with the cows. Um, uh, the, there is a um, part of this story where Surabi, the sacred cow that was made uh, at the, the, the churning of the ocean, praises <coughs> Krishna. Surabi has a um, peculiar property that her udders do not give milk. They give Amrita, the sacred psychedelic. And we know that this doesn't actually come from her, uh, her, me her udders anyway. It comes from her anus, because she, she makes the substrate upon which the psilocybe cubensis um, lives. Now, 
Here is Krishna in the guise of Kali. Uh, Kali, the mother goddess uh, and goddess of destruction. Um, and this is... Um, Kali is also a, um, a drug goddess, but we won't go into that. What I do want to point out that there is a group of sadhus. Now, a sadhu is a religious renunciate who devotes his life, his, always male, to a particular god or goddess. Shivite sadhus go naked covered in cemetery ash. Vishnavite sadhus wear a loincloth and a mark called the tilaka on the forehead. Krishna sadhus are called rasikas, that is, those who partake of rasa, which is another word for the sacred psychedelic. It's also the word for the dance that Krishna does with the gopinis. Um, now, the rasikas are men, but they are transvestite all of them and they wear women's clothes women's perfume jewelry and they seclude themselves for three days every month because they're unclean and and they say they have to become radha that's krishna's wife in order to worship krishna and now i think this is because the you know the original devotees of krishna were women and they were it says in the Purana that as soon as Krishna appeared in the uh, in the fields, and he appeared periodically, when he appeared, that the the Gopinis, the dairy maids, would drop everything. If they were cleaning the house, they they'd leave it. If if they were cooking food, they'd let it burn. If they were looking after children, they'd let them cry, and they'd just go out into the fields and spend the night with Krishna. In the morning, they all thought that they had had sex alone with Krishna. Now, I think that this sex, this so-called sex, is actually code for the psychedelic experience. Their sex with Krishna was actually the psychedelic experience with the mushroom. So, to get back to Bir Kuar, I don't have any pictures of him. He's, he's represented as a wooden stake. So imagine a wooden stake. That's all. <laughs> so, um, so um, this story of Birkua being torn apart by his sister, who is a tiger, kind of rang a bell with me. And it was about a week later that it dawned on me that this is the story of of King Pentheus in the Bacantes by Euripides. I'm going to go forward a little bit. There, um, there, this is the Sparagmos of King Pentheus, where, okay, the, um, the followers of, of Dionysus were m Minads, women. Oh, by the way, Minad means the crazy women. <laughs> it's, it's got the same root as mania. And, and so, uh, Dionysus is often <coughs> thought of as a wine god. Robert Graves, in his uh, foreword to the second edition of the Greek Gods, says, I've changed my mind about Dionysus. He wasn't a wine god after all. Wine was just a vehicle. He was a mushroom god. And the only mushroom that the Graves knew about at that time was Amanita muscaria, uh, which is quite different to psilocybin. But here uh, we see an interesting... Um, event, this is uh, the satyrs and the centaurs are said by graves to be tribes to whom the the, uh, the horse and the goat were totems who worshipped Dionysus. And another thing about Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric mushroom, is that it has a peculiar pharmacology. It contains um, the active ingredient, muscimol, but also something called ebotenic acid, which is slightly um, psychoactive, but mostly just toxic. And so, uh, what happens when you eat it is that the, the liver turns the ebotenic acid into muscimol, and it, most of it is excreted. So, 
in Siberia, and we'll get on to Siberia a little later, the shamans uh, drink or eat the mushroom, pass uh, passes through them into their urine and they, they give their urine to their acolytes to drink. And it is possible that the urine will have more muscimol in it than was actually eaten, which is weird, but that's the way it works. So here we see a satyr holding a wine jug to um, Dionysus's genitals. So this suggests that he is pissing in that pot so that someone could drink it because it is a wine jug. Now, um, also, um, I found this. Uh, this is from the Louvre and it shows Hermes, the god Hermes, holding Dionysus as a baby and he is in purple swaddling clothes. I don't know if royalty use purple swaddling clothes, but I've never heard of it um, anywhere else. But what this resembles is a fungus called ergot, claviceps purpurea, the purple claviceps, that grows on ears of, of rye. And he is holding it in exactly the same way, um, I should show you a, 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 <coughs> an ear of rye that is infected with ergot, but I don't have one here. Um, he's holding it in exactly the same way that ergot grows from rye. So I believe that he wasn't just a mushroom god, he was a god of all uh, psychoactive plants. And uh, the Minad again. Sparagmos, and here's a here's a uh, very tiny picture of Dionysus <laughs> riding on a panther. Well, to get back to this um, Sparagmos, so King Pentheus is, although he is Dionysus's cousin, he is absolutely dead set against Dionysus and wants to keep him out of his city. He is the second king of uh, Thebes. His grandfather Cadmus founded Thebes. But his grandfather, according to the legend, was a devotee of Dionysus. And in this story, which is related in the Bacantes, which means the devotees of, um, of Dionysus, by the way, they, they were called Bacchae or, or Bacantes, uh, he keeps trying to arrest Dionysus and um, and uh, shackle him and turns out he's shackled a bull and things like this until uh, Dionysus persuades him that if he dresses as a Minad he can sneak himself into the secret rites and see the Minads dancing naked and he is all for this and dresses as a mine and by the way many many commentators like uh, classicists who study the Bacante says something weird happens when he puts the Minad's uniform on he dresses himself in Minad's kit and uh, and from there on he's talking weird and he's just staring into space and anybody who's done psychedelics would know that Pentheus is tripping balls. So uh, this is um, this is a precursor, however, to going to m uh, to the mountainside and and spying on the <laughs> minads. And he again he hides in a pine tree, but they discover him. And they say this man has to be killed, or he will betray our women's secrets. And so they, they turn to the leader of the Minads, who happens to be his mother. Not his sister, but this time it's his mother. And she turns into a panther, not a tiger, but a panther, and she tears him apart. This is ridiculously similar to the, th the, the myth of Bir Kuar, and I can't explain why there is a myth in India among tribal people, which is the same as the myth in Greece. Um, although, uh, Dionysus and the Minads were supposed to have <coughs> invaded India uh, and um, uh, beaten the Indians with the Thursos. This is that that thing that she's carrying is a fennel stalk with a pine cone on top, uh, with ribbons tied on it, and sometimes ivy. 
and they are supposed to have used this weapon to kill the Indians, and uh, and they created cities and um, and taught them viticulture, and then came back to to uh, Greece in triumph. Um, well. Uh, this um, seems to indicate that there is some uh, some common thread between Krishna, the um, Birkoa, and Dionysus. Um, this common thread relates to uh, women dress, uh, men dressing as women, and um, or even like imitating women in various ways in order to worship this. Um, psychoactive plant or whatever it is now in in the um, in Siberia where the true shamans come from uh, for instance the Chukchi people say women are naturally shamans they don't need to be trained as shamans men need to be trained and when they qualify as shamans it is said that they've changed sex this is the common term used in the Chukchi language to mean they have qualified as a shaman. And one of the things that they do to uh, indicate that they have uh, qualified is that they wear two metal discs w to represent breasts. In the um, ancient classical world, we saw the same thing with the galley. The uh, Gallus was a priest of, of Kubele. And um, in order to qualify as a priest of Kubele, you danced yourself into a frenzy. They were a bit like the uh, Hare Krishnas. They went around with, with drums and flutes and, uh, and uh, so on and, and um, uh, got the people dancing. And during, during this dance, um, men would pick up a tile from a stack of tiles that were placed uh, within reach, they would break the tile in half and cut their junk off with it. Uh, this, there was a man ready with a with a red hot uh, piece of iron to cauterize the wound for them, um, so they didn't die. But I, I have to think they have to be high on something to do that because <laughs> it sounds extremely painful. And anyway, one. Um, uh, one sign that he was a priest was that he dressed as a woman. Here he's wearing this, Gallus is wearing women's clothes, and also you will see he's wearing two metal discs on his breasts to uh, represent women's breasts, just like the shamans in, um, in Siberia. So, um, there is, I do have a lot more, like, substance sort of to my uh, my paper and if anybody wants it I can give them a copy I have it there's 32 pages of it here um, but if anyone has any questions I'll take them now I've got five minutes uh, yeah um, we could take some questions now if you want some questions yeah huh? yeah uh, oh um, um, by the way I, I'd just like to say that um, at some important point is that um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the works of Mircea Eliade, uh, who was the Romanian taught at Chicago, and he introduced the word shaman into the English language. He wrote a book called uh, The uh, Forge and the Crucible, uh, which was about um, the close relationship between metalworking and shamanism. And uh, indeed, in, in Siberia, they say that the original shaman and the original blacksmith were brothers. Now, it seems to me that until the Iron Age, it was quite <coughs> easy for women to be metal workers. They could, um, it's the, the melting point of copper and the melting point of bronze are much lower than iron. And also, they can be worked um, by people with fairly small muscles, but iron demands, you know, like um, muscles like iron bands, as it says in the poem, and um, and so required a lot of strength 
and I believed that metalworking was taken over by men at this point. And it is quite likely that they took over shamanism at the same time. Now, and this might mean that until this point in time, these, um, these shamanic practices and indeed psychedelic plants as a whole were a women's mystery, a woman, woman's secret. But that um, at the advent of the Iron Age, men appropriated these, these shamanic practices and um, perhaps this is why um, in various cultures uh, witches are supposed to be repelled by iron. I know old uh, houses in this country, particularly Wales, used to have a knife placed underneath the threshold so that witches couldn't enter the house. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that, that's a the executive overview. If anybody wants the, the full thing, I can give them the entire 32 pages. So, questions, yes? Uh, one remark and one question. Eliade wasn't the first one to choose it in English. There was just an exhibition with more than 30 monographies in English language uh, around 1900. So, uh -huh. widespread introduction of the U.S. research uh, didn't want to use the word shame because they had a medicine man. So oh! Long, long taking discussion. Um, but he, but he did call his. He, write, he wrote the seminal work called Shamanism, Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy. Yeah. Right. But thank you for that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll correct my text. And uh, the question I have is, um, you were, um, you were mentioning the use of Amanita Muscara in Siberian shamanism, especially the, the drinking of urine. Uh huh. Um, this phenomenon is uh, widely known throughout North Siberia and Scandinavia from all reindeer holder societies, but not even for shamanism, but also for uh, recreational the normal reindeer yes. holders. Now, because uh, uh, reindeers love mushrooms, and especially Amanita Muscara, and there are uh, several cases when reindeer holders are describing their reindeers, uh, well, lying around and <laughs> having <laughs> eaten too much mushrooms, and then the reindeer holders gather urine and drinking urine. I've so heard about that, but I really need a reference for it, because <laughs> it seems to me it's very difficult to follow a reindeer around with a cup. And go, you know, please piss me. Yeah, but, you know. well, they, they eat the snow. <laughs> uh, but mushrooms don't grow in the snow. No, but the, the, the deer eats the mushroom, yeah. and the deer then wheeze on the, on the snow. But I'm saying that um, mushrooms don't grow in the season oh where, yeah. it, where it snows. They, they, because yeah. I've thought about this, but I would like a reference if you have, if you have a reference for... Have to look at it for this, but I will give you a Thank you, like thank you. Yes. Uh, one Sorry. question uh, about uh, sex changing. Yes. In the legend about Ganesha, there is also a female Ganesha named Varani, what the name, but uh, also Ganesha is a baby changed to sex. You know about I don't story? know about that. I mean, I'd oh, love to hear about that. Yes, there's a lady at the back. I, I was just going to say, um, I read about that story um, in the Sunday Times many years ago about the rain, reindeer. Um, mm -hmm. And the author was a chap called Brogan Taylor, who I believe is sort of Lancashire based, oh. University of Lancaster. I okay. don't know whether you could follow it back. Oh, that's thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, yes. I've got that book from Ah, okay. Thanks, Paul. I'm just curious about the timeline. Oh, yes. So, um, for the Siberian shamanism with the, the, the decoration of the bus. Yes. And for this Greek. So, what would be. We only know about <coughs> Siberian shamanism from the modern period. I think from um, the 18th century, there was a guy called Langsdorf who described the, the, the practice. It's Swedish. Uh, a mm. Swedish uh, military officer with a German name. Um, so that's the, I believe, the first um, mention of, uh, of <coughs> eating Amanita muscaria and, uh, and also the psychoactivity of the urine. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the galley uh, were, um, you know, around the beginning of this era, like a couple of centuries BC to, to you know, when they were um, 
annihilated by the, the Christians about in the fourth century. Yes. A really obvious question. Um, Please. <laughs> so what do you think these kind of representations and these creation myths and religions meant for women's place in society at the time? So kind of just taking it back to an archaeological perspective, what can we actually take from these? You know, what does this actually mean for women's place in society? What? Um... Well, it's very difficult to determine the women's place in society in ancient India and so on. Um, they, um, it's quite possible that the Indus Valley civilization was a very egalitarian um, society with, uh, you know, respect given to to women. But about 2500 BC we have the Aryans moving into northern India and they were definitely patriarchal and assigned a very low role to women um, but it's very possible that uh, that the, that the preceding societies of um, like the the Indus Valley and so on um, it's very possible that they they assigned a much higher status to women um, and, but with the only evidence we really have is their seals these um, earthenware seals that they made uh, of which there are many thousands but um, th there doesn't seem to be any um, clear patriarchy there that, that the women and, and men seem to have similar roles um, yeah I think more of radiation. I think it's possible that this stuff dates back to the Proto-Indo-European culture, which was in contact with uh, some of these Siberian societies, um, and it spread out into northern India, Europe, and um, and the Middle East. Um, and oh, and by the way, this is not the only example of the um, uh, of stealing women's clothes of spying on on naked women we have the we have the story of Acteon and we even have in in um, you know in Scotland there's uh, Tam who uh, and who um, although it's just one witch dancing naked or in the cutty sock that she had worn since she was 12 as it says in the poem um, he um, it seems to be the same myth and um, so it could have been a, di a, a case of diffusion, of dissemination, and not separate inventions of the same story. Thank you very much, Mike. Oh, you're welcome.